Well, good evening. Good to see each one of you here tonight. And as we come to this midweek service, uh, time to renew, refresh, refuel, to face the rest of the week. As we begin our service tonight, would there be a prayer request on your heart tonight that we need to lift up in prayer? Okay. Remember those requests. I think you guys will be traveling here in the next few days. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Remember uh, those folks as they travel and for uh, a funeral. Any others? Good, yes. Oh, good. Yes, God answers prayers. Yeah. Any others? Yeah. Remember, Jackie's he recuperates from this. Any others? Okay, remember that request. Any others or an unspoken request, just by the lift of the hand? Let's pray together. Would you stand with us as we pray? Father God, Lord, we come to you tonight with just thanksgiving in our heart. You've provided ways and means that we can be in your house tonight. And it's just not an accident that we're here. We're here by divine appointment. You've got something special in store for us tonight. So, God, we just lift up each request that's been made mention tonight. You know the need even before we speak those. But when we speak those aloud and we join together, we stand in agreement with our brothers and sisters and uh, lift them up to you, knowing that you're hearing and you're already moving upon each situation. God, we give you praise for that. And, Lord, for this service tonight, for the singing, for the spoken word, whatever it is, Lord, it's all for your honor and for your glory. As Brother Brian comes tonight and speaks, I do pray that you would anoint him anew and afresh. And once again, Lord, we love you, we give you praise, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, join us as we sing now.
my bark he does safely keep and he leads me gently on through this world below he's a real friend to me oh i love him so oh i want to see him look upon his face there to sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory let me lift my voice cares all redeemed are gathering in. I am thinking of the rapture in our blessed home on high when the redeemed are gathering in. How we'll raise a heavenly anthem in that city in the sky when the redeemed are gathering in. When the redeemed like snow and free from all sin. How we'll shout and how we'll sing when the redeemed are gathering in. There will be a great procession over on the streets of gold when the redeemed are gathering in. Oh, what music, oh, what singing or that city will be gathering in when the redeemed are gathering in washed like snow and free from all sin how we'll shout and how we'll sing when the redeemed are gathering in saints will sing redemption story with their voices clear and strong when the redeemed gathering in then the angels all will listen for they cannot join that song when the redeemed are gathering in when the redeemed are gathering in wash like snow and free from all sin how we'll shout of the Lord when the redeemed are gathering in when the redeemed are gathering in wash like snow and free from all sin how we'll shout and how we'll sing when the redeemed are gathering in Worship with our giving now. Brother John David, would you uh, bless the offering, please? have a word they want to share tonight, a testimony that they would like to share, or any 
Amen, yes. Anyone else? I know God has blessed us all this week with just being able to be here. We've got enough health to, to be out tonight. So uh, God is so good to us. Well, does anybody have a special song then? You want to sing one, Sister Jean? songs like that and you just think about it it, it makes you a little homesick but can, you know if you just notice how many people just here recently I mean you don't have to be old young people how many people has made that transition over to the other side something we're all going to do you know I read something this week going to church won't get you into heaven that's a good start but we need that personal relationship with Jesus. We need that blood applied to our lives to get us into heaven, to that place that Sister Jeannie just sang about. Tonight we got a special treat. Uh, Brother Brian, he's going to speak to us. So give him a good uh, Bernard Ridge welcome as he comes. That was one minute. 
It was 47 seconds before Randy chuckled. Before somebody noticed that something's not really right. Isn't it awkward, though, whenever somebody is, uh, you know they're supposed to be doing something, but they're just not doing it. They might look the part. They're standing in the part. They're like, okay, we got the introduction, but he's just standing there not doing anything. Could be. But we're, when, when somebody's in a position to be doing something and they're not doing it, you think, oh, wait a minute. This should be a little better than this, right? We should be doing something a little different. Psalm 139. O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and my uprising. You understand my thoughts afar off. Thou can pass my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O oh Lord, thou knowest it all together. Thou hast been, thou hast beset me and behind, and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high, and I cannot attain unto it. No matter what you're doing, no matter what we're doing, no matter where you're at, God knows your thoughts. Whenever you're... Uh, when you're maybe even playing the part, whenever you're doing the part and it looks like you're, you're, you're doing what you're supposed to be, but the Lord knows whether you really are or not. He says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know me when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. If the Lord is speaking to you in a gentle whisper, which is the way he was heard, a still, small voice, it's going to be hard to hear him from afar, right? You search out my path and my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You, I love, this English Standard Version says, you hem me in. Anybody ever felt like they've been hemmed in and something? Felt like an old hog trying to get out somewhere. You got to hem it in. You hem me in behind and before me and lay your hand on me. And whenever I was doing something I wasn't supposed to be, and mom or daddy knew I was supposed to be doing it, they laid their hand on me. Now, they could take me in their arms, and that's altogether different, right? But when them hands get a hold of you, <laughs> it's a, that's different. And I was hemmed in at that point. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me and is high, and I cannot attain it. These verses are cried out from a desperate heart that knows that God really is who he says he is. It knows what God can do, all while knowing that they're not doing it. It's not what he's doing now. Anybody know that God has done stuff in your life, but you don't really know what he's doing now or why he's doing it? We've gone through some things, and I've seen some things and heard some things, and I, I looking back, I know why God did what he did, but my goodness, while we were in the thick of it, while I was hemmed in, I didn't know why he was doing what he was doing. And I can't know that, especially if I'm looking at him from a distance. If he's a distance, a far off from me, if he knows my thoughts from afar, whether I know him or not. You have searched me and known me. You discern my thoughts from afar. I mean, that's just, I love that verse because God never leaves us. He never leaves us or forsakes us. But if he's afar off, that means I'm not close to him. And you can flee or run away from your relationship or your calling, but you can never run away from the physical presence of the Lord because he's everywhere. You can't leave him. You know, I've heard it said, you, you get into this debate whether you can lose your salvation or it's once saved. Oh, we, we get all these different stances, but I, I think it's a really simple thing that, just to throw this in there, in, in talking about being a far away from God, I, I don't, you can't, your, your salvation is not something you will lose. It's not a coin that's going to fall out of your pocket, but you can leave it. You can walk off and leave it, and it can't be from afar. When you're standing up doing something or you have something to be doing, and you're not doing it. 
You're doing just totally the opposite of what you're supposed to be doing. Things get awkward. It took 47 seconds for Randy to laugh. He's like, this, this is what's going on here. And then if I, you kept going, it just gets more and more awkward. People get uncomfortable. You ever known about the, been that way? When you're, when you're close to someone and they're living a life contrary to the way you know that they, they should be, and things get just awkward. Things get so awkward. And you want to say something. You want to, you want to speak up. Are you okay? You have straight, you have stage fright. Do we laugh about it and kind of sh- you just shrug it off, you know, for a little bit? Yeah, then we realize this is not getting any better. <laughs> yeah, let's do something different. One of my favorite stories, I love reading about Jonah. Because Jonah was a human. He was a Brian in the most sense. In Jonah chapter 1, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. That, is, that, is that plain? Does it get any plainer than that? I mean, it's, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, tells who his daddy was and all this thing. All right, we know who it's going to. Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare, went down into it. To go with them to Tarshish, it says that three times. Oh, we know where he's going. Away from the presence of of the Lord. So I, I looked it up, and in a straight line, because I don't know how you do, do the mapping out, but from when he went down to Joppa, he said, I want you to go to Nineveh. From Joppa straight to Nineveh was 500 miles. From Joppa to Tarshish was 2,500 miles. He's getting out of the way. Not only did he say, I'm not going there, but I'm going just as far that way as I can, just the opposite of what I can do. But, you know, he knew that he couldn't flee from the presence of the Lord. But he has given it his best shot. And any time we do that, it tells us exactly how it's going to, be, how it's going to go. In, in verse 3, But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa. He found a ship going to Tarshish. He found him a way to get away from God, so he thought. And he paid the fare. Anytime we're doing the opposite of what God tells us to do, when we receive a word from the Lord and we do the opposite of that or we know what we're supposed to be doing we're not doing it, it'll cost you. It'll cost you every bit. It'll cost you more than you want to pay. And it says, and he paid the fare. And then he went down into the ship. It cost him first, and then he went on the trip. In verse 9, when everything started getting out of the way, so everything started getting out of hand, and he was, they were on the way, and it says the Lord, before that, and it says the Lord, the Lord hurled a great wind. If a storm comes in your life and you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, it's not bad luck. God says, here, you need this. I'm hurling this to you. It's not just a bad chance that, well, you, didn't, you, know, you made a bad turn when you went the opposite of what God told you to do. But the Lord hurled a great wind in verse 4. And then in verse 9, they come down and said, Hey, man, how in the world are you sleeping with all this going on? What, what, what's the deal? What's going on? He said, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord. <laughs> you reckon? Did he fear the Lord? Not really. He said, I fear the Lord. He looked like he's playing a part. He said, I'm called a prophet. God told me. He sent me a word. We're going someplace. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. He didn't even believe what he said he believed. And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What have you done? (laughs) I've looked at myself and said that a couple times. What have you done? But instead of saying, Hey, all right, I need to go back to where I was told to be and go the direction I'm told to be, he said, Just throw me in the water. Just get rid of me. It's better for me to die. That's what he was thinking was going to happen. God had another plan. We all know the rest of that story. He, he was far away from God when he was once close to God because it says the word of the Lord came to Jonah and told him what to do. God doesn't just give his word and his instruction to someone unless he's close to them. So all my life. I, I grew up, had one grandpa that loved uh, Stanley Brothers and go in the house and that would just be blaring on that old record player, Ralph Stanley and all of them. 
And then uh, my grandpa Brockman, he loved Jerry Clower, and I've loved been crazy about them both all my life. I remember the kids listening to tapes and records and all of them. But uh, one of my one of, one of the great Jerry Clower stories he said. Uh, Ma and Pa was riding to town in a truck, and, and Ma looked over and said, Pa, do you remember when we first got married and we were so in love? We just loved each other. And we'd ride to town, and we used to sit right beside each other, and you'd put your arm around me. And I felt so special. She said, I just felt like a queen riding to town. You were so proud of me. I wanted people to look at me and see who I was, and you had your arm around me. We were going to town. We were so in love, weren't we, Pa? And he said, yeah, we were. She said, Pa, don't you wish we could be like that? We could just, you know, ride like we used to. And he, said, he just turned and looked at her and said, Ma, I ain't moved. <laughs> he was still sitting in the same place. God, was, God is still stationary. Jesus Christ is the same today, tomorrow, forever. Yesterday, today, and forever. He's always going to be there. We're the ones that move. We're the ones that move away. We can slide all the way over 2,500 miles away from where he tells us to be, but you know what? He'll meet us right there. He'll meet us right there. Romans 1.20, For his invisible attributes, talking about God's, namely his divine nature and his eternal power have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. We don't have any excuse. We know that God is who he says he is, even if we've never heard the name of Jesus. By the things that have been made for his invisible attributes, namely his divine nature and his eternal power, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation. He is the creator. In the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. You know, James tells us that for him who knows to do good, and he don't do it, what is it? A little bitty word in it. It's got big implications, though. Whenever we know to do better and we run 2,500 miles in the wrong direction, or we attempt to, but did, did Jonah make it? He had a plan, didn't he? He had a plan where he was going to go. I'm going 2,500 miles away, running away from God, when I just would take a 500-mile journey to go this way to do what he wants me to do. But he didn't make it. He paid the fare. And he didn't even make it where he said he was going to go. God's got a way of working with us that way, don't he? He's got a way of working on us that way. And James says it is sin. Sin is separation toward God. It's separation from God. And that's Psalm 139, 2. Can you go back there, Jeff? You understand is my thought from afar off. What's that separation? Sin. That sin. We said it was sin. That's a separation of God. We're far off. We're afar off. He still understands you. He knows when you sit down. He knows when you get up. He understands your thoughts from afar off. Even though you may not understand why God still loves you. You may not understand that you might not even believe that God still does love us. He understands us from afar off. We're the ones that are afar off. In Acts 2.37, uh, it says, When they heard this and they were cut to the heart, their heart was pricked, knowing that God loved them so much, knowing what they had done against him about crucifying Christ. And they cried out to, the, to Peter and the other disciples and said, What shall we do? Right there was the turnaround. You see that where they got to a point where they said, what shall we do? Jonah had three days to think about that. In a place that was pretty nasty, he said, what am I going to do? He said, repent, number one. Go the other direction. Stop going the direction you're going. Stop going 2,500 miles wide open in the wrong direction. Let's go back this way. Repent, turn around, and be baptized, he said. So we have to address the problem. You know, a lot of times whenever we get into situations and we start addressing symptoms. We start working with the symptoms. We start trying to address symptoms of problems. And if I've got a flood in the house, taking a mop and trying to dry the water up is not going to fix anything. Shut the water off. Fix the leak. Quit mopping up water. And 
if everything that I cook, I cook a lot. I enjoy cooking because I like to eat good food. And, I mean, I'm not saying Lindsay cooks great too. I'm just saying that I like what I like. But now I live in a house of five women, so I just kind of get to cook what they like. So, but if everything that I cook is burning, if I'm burning absolutely everything up, should I change the recipe? I can add different ingredients. What's going to happen when I change the ingredients? They're going to burn up too. Wait a minute. It's the skillet. I need to get a different skillet. I put them same ingredients in that skillet. What's going to happen to them? They're going to burn up too. I need to adjust the heat. Turn the heat down. Turn the flame down. Turn the Whatever you got, turn it down. You got it too hot and you're going to burn everything that gets in that. If we're doing something in life and you keep running into a wall, you keep running into a wall and it seems like God keeps hurtling things at you and hurtling things at you and you say, you know what? Now sometimes life happens and we don't know why it happens, but whenever you know 100%, I mean without a doubt, something's wrong here and I think it's me. Everything just keeps burning up. Repent and be baptized. That's what they said. What shall we do? You have to address the problem. And uh, let me tell you, I know from experience, I don't know if this comes with just being hard-headed me, if it's part of being um, a male, I don't know what it is. It seems like the, my girls aren't as bad to do this. They will point fingers a little bit, but it's not everyone else around you's problem. <laughs> right here. That, that's A lot of times, that's... What, that, that's what happens. It's not everyone else around me. It's definitely not a holy and righteous God. Jonah said, I fear the Lord, the God of heaven. I, I'm the one, I fear him. You, might, you, might, you probably should be afraid of it. Think back to that old song, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Sometimes that's where we got to go, ain't it? My... Uh, all-time favorite, probably my favorite because of, of me and myself. If not my favorite scripture, my favorite psalm definitely is Psalm 51. Because David got real when somebody came to him and said, Hey, thou art the man. It's you. And whatever situation that is in life, it, it doesn't even have to be a completely serious problem. But I, I love how real that David got. Psalm 51, when he said, have mercy on me, O God. He led out with that right there. Knowing where I stand with a holy and righteous God, the first thing I need to cry out is, have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, I know you love me, but I am in the wrong here. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin there wasn't any way he was not pointing any fingers or calling out anybody else it's me it's me oh lord for i know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me and here's where he goes back to god he said against you and you only have i sinned and done what is evil in your sight might look okay to everyone else around, but hey, everybody else is doing it. They don't work with God. They don't work with God. So that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth and inward being. God's all about truth. And you teach me wisdom in the secret place. Purge me and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be watered in the snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. That's what he wants back. He knows the joy and gladness from life is gone. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew the spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take me not, take not your Holy Spirit away from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. The joy of salvation. Christ died so that we could be free. That's the reason, to be free. If we're living in bondage still, you're not free. You don't have that joy. Jonah was running. He was running away. That's not freedom. 
that's in bondage to your desires and yourself. In 2 Kings chapter 6, I, I love this story because it's right in there and it's just a kind of a random story. And you think, where in the world did this come from? Where, I, I don't even know how, how it fit in there. And it says, now one of the prophets said to Elisha, see, the place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. But hey, you know what? We've got to get it. We're working men. We want to do something about it. So let's go down to the Jordan, they said, and let's everyone cut us a pole, cut us a tree down, and we'll build us a new place. It's a bigger place where we can all be together. And so they did that. They went, and they wanted Elisha to go with them. And it says, as one was felling a log, his axe head fell into the water. What's going to happen to that? Huh? Same thing happened to Nathan's phone. Same thing that happened to Nathan's phone when Jeff took him fishing. Only thing he caught was a cold. Had a wet phone and tried to point around, blame it on Shanda. I'm telling on him right now. I can do that. He said I was in charge up here. If Shanda hadn't tried to call him, it wouldn't have been in his pocket, and it wouldn't fell in the water. He said I could say what I wanted, so here I am. But it says, as one was fell in a log, his axe head fell into the water, and he cried out, Alas, my master, it was borrowed. It wasn't even his axe, but he wanted to go to work with it. And while he was working, it came off the handle and flew in the water, and it sank. And then the man of God said, where did it fall? He knew something was wrong, right? If you're working and working and working, and all of a sudden everything, all the work stops. Uh-oh. And what was it? It was borrowed. It wasn't even his. Your life's not your own either. You can call it your own. Where'd you get it? It's borrowed. It's but a vapor. Here for a little while and then gone. It's borrowed. But then I love the, the same thing. Just like the prophet Nathan going to David, he said, where did it fall? I've got to get serious about my sin, my iniquity. Whatever's put in that distance in between me and God pointed out, where did it fall? He said, well, I, I don't know. That's what he could have said, wasn't it? Because he was working. He was slinging that axe, and then the head come off of it, and I, it, it, it just fell. I don't, I don't know where it fell. I know a lot more about my sin than I let on. We all do. Where did it fall? When he showed him the place, right here, see this, right here, and right here, that's where it's at. Where did it fall? It fell in my mind, and I didn't get rid of it. And I let it settle down in my heart, and that's the way I started acting. That's where it fell. And he showed him the place, and he cut off a stick. And he threw it in there. Threw it in where? We know it means in the water. But he cut off that stick that to me is an image of the cross of Christ. The only thing that bridged the gap between the abyss where my borrowed life was and back out into the living world. He cut off a stick and threw it in there and I love that the King James Version says, and the iron did swim. Does iron swim? It don't have any arms. It ain't got no legs. It ain't got no life jacket. It sank on its own, didn't it? It sank on its own, but whenever the cross of Christ got a hold of it, <laughs> it floated. It was restored. And then he said the same thing that Jesus said, not literally, but the same thing that Jesus said when Lazarus come walking out of that tomb. What happened then? Don't leave him in those grave clothes. You all unwrap him. It's not bound by that death anymore. It's not bound by, that, by the abyss. It's not bound by that sin anymore. He said, and the iron did float, and he said, take it up. Get it. It's no good if you leave it down there dead to you. Pick it up. 
He said, take it up. So he reached out his hand and took it. But you know what that meant right then when he picked up that axe. What was he doing before the axe fell? He was cutting down a tree. He was working. So guess what he's going to do now that he's got it back up out of the water? It's time to do more work. It's not always going to be easy. It was borrowed. He lost it. He got it back, and now it's time to get back it, back to work again. But he had to humble himself and say, Master, I lost it, and it wasn't mine. I just had that borrowed for a little while, and i got to take it back to the one that it belongs to. Well, guess what? That's what's going to happen with us. It's going, we're going, we, God wants us back. To live as Christ, to die is gain. We're going with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We're going in with them. It's borrowed here for just a little while. We've got to address the problem, cry out for help. Matthew 16 says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, deny yourself. Master, it was borrowed. It's me. It's me, O oh Lord. Wash me. Cleanse me. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You have to lay your flesh on that altar and its desires. You know what an altar is good for? Not necessarily this altar, literally, but it is spiritually. An altar in the day of sacrifice was only, was only good for two things. That was death and sacrifice. That was it. So when we're here, when you're on your knees, when you're at home in prayer, whenever you're wherever you are on that altar, you are laying yourself on an altar only for death and sacrifice. Not for show, not to look good, not so somebody will think something different, so that you think God will reach down and, and, and save you because I just came up here and knelt down. You not die to yourself. Whoever loses his life for my sake, for my sake. But you have to know and accept that this life isn't ours, don't we? It's borrowed. Some of us get to borrow it for a long time. Some of us get to borrow it for just a short time. We don't, we don't know how long those days are. But Psalm, going back, I opened up with Psalm 139. I want to close with Psalm 139. We go to verse 7. Where shall I go from your spirit? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are the works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Now here we go. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, all my days. All my days were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. He says, God, you knew everything that I was going to do before I ever did it. I don't know how many days I'm going to live, but you've known every one of them. You've had them written down since before I ever lived one of them. And every part of my body, the way it was going to be, you had that formed and you made that before I ever knew anything about it. This life is borrowed. We should do well with it, right? 
We all have to answer three questions. How did you get here? We just read about that. I don't think there's any question about that. How, how did we get here? What are you doing here? What are we doing? Did we just come in here on Sunday, Wednesdays? See y'all back here Sunday. See you back Wednesday. We go to work. We stay home. Whatever we do, do you just go through the motions? Are we here to bring to bring honor and glory to Christ and to lead other people to Him? That that's our job. That's what we're here for. We're all ministers of the gospel. Whether you have that calling to preach, whether you have that calling to what you're a minister of the gospel with your life. What are you doing with the days that God has allotted you? He has a plan. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for me. His ways. God's ways. He wants us to be close enough to hear Him when He speaks. When He speaks as that gentle whisper, we've got to be close. Not afar off. He knows our thoughts and we're afar off, but we can't know His because He's not going to say, no, you're afar. I, I'm not giving that to you. He has a plan for you. Are you close enough to hear Him whisper to you or are you at a distance? Because he discerns your thoughts from afar. And when he, need, when he needs to, he'll hem you in from behind and before and lay his hand on you because I know, because he has me. He tells us that he, he disciplines those that he loves. He chastens those whom he, whom he loves. I don't think that it was any coincidence, Sister Jeannie, she sang that song, uh, talking about no darkness in heaven and closing out in Psalm 139. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. God can bring light in any of the darkest spots in my life. That's what he does. He restores joy. He restores peace. Any darkness that we have, in our, he shines his light on it, and the darkness has to flee. And one thing that I, I, I think he showed me in Genesis when Adam and Eve sinned against God, it said they hid amongst the trees. What were the trees? The trees were created by God. That, that's God's creation. But they hid amongst the trees. And he was crying out for them, where are you? Where are you? And the only thing that we can hide behind is our sin. Because that's a separation between us and God. That's a separation. And we can hide behind that just like Adam and Eve hid behind those trees because they knew they were naked, they knew they were ashamed, they felt so wrong about it. Something was wrong, and they hid. The only place we can hide is from behind our sin. Once we step out, that shadow no longer casts over us. Whenever he says, hey, where did it fall? We just step out. See, right here. Right here is where it is. Right here, right here, that's where it fell, and he'll shine that light on us. As we close... Uh, I had a song that just really that came to me and kind of seemed to hit on this. And it, it brought me to tears to listen to it. Um, I know that God prepares those things for us, and, and music to me is very spiritual. Music is very, it, it can move you in, in, in good ways and bad ways. Some of it is very spiritual in a bad way. But this song says everything that, to me, it sums up this whole message. It sums up this whole Psalm 51, uh, Psalm 139, it just, uh, he really hit me. And um, so as we, as, as Jeff plays this song, as I close, uh, whatever prayer, whatever thing, whatever may be on your heart, that, that separation, whatever that sin, wherever you may be afar off in your life, whether big or small, I, I've never been too close to God. And I, I felt like I've been a lot closer at times, and I feel like I've been a lot farther but I've never been too close. And I long for those days sometimes when I know that I'm, I've, I'm stepping away, like I, I've not devoted myself, I've not laid myself on that altar, I've not had that self, that death and that sacrifice, and I start feeling just odd. And I just got to lay myself down. Say, God, it's me. It's me. So Jeff's going to play this song now.
Let this be. 